Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. So welcome to Calvary today. Uh, we've been um, in the book of Ephesians and Pastor Ryan has been on vacation this past week. He took some time off with his family while the kids were on spring break and he's been down in Florida. He's on his way back today. Uh, and I just wanna thank him for the confidence that he has shown in me to come to the pulpit this morning and bring you the word. I don't take that lightly, friends, honest. Um, it means a lot uh, to me to when I have this microphone in my hand that I rightly divide the word of truth, that I represent God well and right. I can't play with that, that's too important and I wanna be held accountable to God for everything that comes out of my mouth this morning through his Holy Spirit. So I do thank Pastor Ryan for the confidence that he's placed in me to be able to bring the word. Like I said, we've been in the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters, and when he comes back next Sunday, he'll get into the chapter four, and then we'll be going four through six. So get ready, read up on that this week, be prepared for those messages as we get started again next Sunday. In the first several months here, and going through Ephesians one through three, there's been several things that I wanted to draw our attention to again this morning. I'm not re-preaching his messages, I just wanted to remind us of a few things, before we get started. One, that believers in Christ have spiritual and heavenly blessings that we will not find in this world. In Christ, we are holy, blameless, adopted, wanted, reclaimed, redeemed, and restored. We're free, forgiven, valuable, accepted, and we are powerful and strong in Christ. Jesus longs to fill us and make us complete. God's love for me is immeasurably greater than any love on this earth. No one, friends, loves us like God does. No one does. I don't have to prove my worth to be loved by him or work for that love either. It's unconditional all the time. God is limitless, boundless, and capable of infinitely more than we ask or think. You see, when Christ died on the cross, he said what? It is finished. End of the sentence, period. It is finished, it is done. It meant that when he died on the cross, sin was forgiven and we now had a way directly to God through him. Jesus became the way, he became the truth, he became the life. Jesus paid the ultimate price by dying on the cross so that we no longer have to carry around our guilt, our shame, our anxieties, or our sin. <laughs> we can be forgiven and our relationship with God restored. And that's exactly why we celebrated Easter last week. And praise God together this morning that over 39 souls gave their hearts to the Lord during our production and Easter services. Praise God. Church, that's a compliment to you too. Uh, you invited individuals. We had a lot of children give their hearts to the Lord, so they began their new lives with Christ last week during the production. And, and thank you for handing out the invitations and for being available. And may I encourage you to continue to be available to those in your workplace and your family. Don't let it go what they saw, what they heard. Ask them, hey, what did you think about that? Maybe they've had some time now to think about the production or think about what Pastor Ryan shared on Easter Sunday. Don't hesitate to go back and ask them what's going on because we want to reap a harvest and we want to continue to water that seed. We have a choice, friends, to pursue this unhindered relationship with Christ. And when we do, our slate is wiped clean, we are made new. In John 3, it calls us being born again. And that's what we have in Christ today. This morning, the title of my message is The Great Exchange. The Great Exchange. Exchange simply means to give up for something else. To give and receive. Today, we're referring to giving up something to God and receiving something back from Him as well. Now, why is this message so important to me that I felt that I should share this specific message today? Well, one, I recognize and I'm being reminded that in God, we have all we need. We just sang about that this morning. 
In God, we have all we need. We heard it from the Lord himself today. We have all that we need in him. We don't always receive all God has for us, though. And this can leave us wanting, it can leave us empty, it can leave us fearful, it can lead us spinning our wheels. I, I, get, I call it getting caught up sometimes in the what ifs. What if this happens? What if that, what if God doesn't answer my prayer? What if? And sometimes we get lost in that. We keep dealing with the same things over and over again and it becomes overwhelming for us. Uh, perhaps we're showing, you know, what real darkness looks like, and we'll be talking about that today. The first part of, of these three exchanges that we'll be talking about today is the ultimate exchange. The ultimate exchange is where we surrender ourselves to God. We lay ourselves down before God. We exchange all of ourselves. We hand ourselves over to Him, and in exchange, He provides our freedom a great bounty or feast. We surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ and ask him to be the Lord of our lives. We exchange all we are for everything Christ has provided us through the death and resurrection. I, I like to look at this as this huge, humongous table, like a great feast. So if you would, you know, imagine with me today this humongous table set before us, okay? You walk into this dining room and this table goes on for days, okay? And, and it's, you know, I kind of envision it like the movies, you know, those great tables and their hair is all up in buns and they've got corsets on and they can't breathe. I don't even know how they eat, all right? But this is not the table I want you to envision today, okay? Because this table is very comfortable. It's cushy chairs, okay? And there's not 18 forks and several spoons and number of knives there that you have to choose and pick from to eat with. And there's not several glasses, so you don't know which one to drink out of. It's a very comfortable table table that God has set before us. It's a great feast. It's a great bounty. <clears throat> it's kind of like the greatest smorgasbord, the great, greatest buffet of all time, where we have the choicest meats. They're lean, and they're good, and they're cooked well. <clears throat> I shouldn't do this to the 11 o'clock <laughs> It worked at 9, nine o'clock, but the 11 o'clock, your belly's going to start growling. It has this great meat. It has good vegetables, fresh vegetables, and they're organic, okay? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with them, all right? There's great fruits to eat from, all right? It's a great bounty that God has set before us, and we can sit there with him at this bounty and eat with him. Just picture that today. That's the table that God has set before us with everything that we need. Do you want to know what's the greatest thing of all about being at this feast? It's free. Jesus paid the price for it. And we have the opportunity to come and sit down. We can be satisfied. We can be full. We can be healthy. We can be made whole. and We are energized but it's our choice to come to the table and eat. See, Christ invites us to come to this table. He did that when he died on the cross for us. And we've got to accept the invitation. We have to RSVP to the great feast. We do that by surrendering ourselves to God. We exchange all of our independence, who we think we are, all of ourselves, for dependency upon God alone. The cool thing about this, that when we do that, like I said, God provides everything we need. And it says this in 2 Peter chapter 1. God has provided everything that we need for life and godliness. Let's take a look at that scripture today. 2 Peter chapter 3. You can look in your Bibles this morning. It will be on the screen or you can get into your app today. Whichever works for you, it's okay. 2 <clears throat> Peter 3. I'm going to read the first two verses there. 3 and 4. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly, dynamic spiritual life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. That means we have a personal knowledge of him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human's desires. 
God provides everything we need for life. And the life here, because when I first read this, uh, you know, or when I would try to interpret it, I think of life, our everyday life, you know, like it talks about in Romans chapter 12. But this life here is Zoe life, all right? That means, all right, that's a Greek word, and some people you know are named Zoe, okay? It's, it's real life. It's dynamic life. It's abundant life. Life. I can't express it enough. I can't be demonstrative enough today to express how awesome this life is. It has great, it's great in quantity. It's more than adequate. It's abounding. It's rich and satisfying. It fills until it overflows. I mean, an absolute fullness of life. A life that is real. It's genuine. It's active and vigorous. It's devoted to God. It's blessed. It's life. <laughs> it's exciting. It's powerful. It, it, it just gets you up in the morning. It's life. <laughs> it's abundant life. In John, it talks about the fact that when uh, Jesus left, he said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And God, and at the end of the, of the book of John, he says, God breathed into them the breath of life. And they became his, his uh, followers, his true followers. They came to know Christ. We have that same opportunity today. We have that in Christ. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. It goes on to talk about in, Rome, in, first, in Second Peter, sorry, 1, 5 through 9, in view of all this, Make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, moral excellence with knowledge and self-control and patient endurance and godliness and brotherly affection and with brotherly affection, a love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So God not only provides this abundant life for us, but he also provides a way for us to live a godly life, to, to, to live out our life for him. That means we're fully devoted to God. We're all in. We're, we're choosing right living. We're, re -cho we're choosing respect and reverence to God and his plan. We do all we can to please God, not man. And we do that by supplementing our faith with the excellence, with knowledge, with self-control, with patient endurance. Let me pause there. Self-control, patient endurance. I'd have to say that for me, Okay. Godliness, brotherly affection, and love for everyone. We have been provided with everything we need for life and godly living when we come to his table to feast. But here's something that takes us even deeper. This ultimate exchange requires surrender. Now, none of you are like me, but I don't like to surrender. I don't like to wave the white flag. Ask my kids. My Ashley's 33 years old, and she'll say, I'll not play a game with you, Mom, ever again. Because she remembers when she was seven years old, and I was flicking her sorry piece off the board because, ha, 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 you got to go back to home. <laughs> Let me tell you, she's 33, and she still won't play a game with me without asking, Mom, are you going to be nice? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh, I've gotten better over the years, all right? I'm not as mean as I used to be <laughs> to them. We all have to learn how to lose, right? <laughs> Sorry. I've been better. All right. This surrender thing, though, the waving of the white flag. Recently, over the last couple months, God was pinpointing something inside of me that I saw as a... I, I want to call it, it's not a darkness like evil darkness, but it was just something I was holding on to with a death grip in my life. And God says, Dorothy, you need to let that go. You need to surrender that to me. And I'm like, Lord, I don't want to surrender that to you. 
I don't want you to tell me what to do and when to do it and how to do it. I don't want to. God continues to, through the power of his spirit, gently woo us, doesn't he? And gently mold us and gently shape us and says, you need to let that go. And so, much like Jacob did with the angel of the Lord, we wrestle a little bit with God, we journal a little bit, we pray a little bit, we worship a little bit, but it still comes back around to the fact you got to let that go. God says, what's on the other side of that surrender is much better than where you are right now. Where I'm taking you is much better than where you are right now. Let go. You open your hands, you wave the white flag, you say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. And let me tell you something, folks. Supernaturally, you felt, I felt a breaking in my spirit. I knew God had set me free from that thing that I was holding on to. It was, it was cool. God is just too cool. All right, that's the kind of ultimate exchange I'm talking about, where we come, and maybe we don't like everything that's at the table, but we sit down there and we choose to eat it anyway, because it's good for us, because it'll make us healthy, because it will be satisfying, because it will provide for us energy. It will make us full. It will make us whole. That's the exchange that God is asking from us today. It requires surrender. In 2 Peter 1.10, in the Amplified, it says, Brothers or believers, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing. Be sure that your behavior reflects and confirms your relationship with God. And by doing these things, actively developing these virtues, you will never stumble in your spiritual growth and you'll live a life that leads others away from sin. Look at what it says there. Be diligent. That's active. That's an active word. Be diligent. That means you're pursuing God. Behave. <laughs> Behave yourself. <laughs> Behave yourself in such a way that it reflects and confirms our relationship with God. Are we following his word? Actively develop these virtues. Again, there's an action word, actively develop. That's intentional. Again, it's pursuit. And it says you'll never stumble in your spiritual growth. Well, wait a minute now. I know that I have tripped along the path, okay? And it might have been just a pebble. And other times it was a boulder. Sometimes it's a tree root, whatever. But I've tripped and I have fallen. What do you mean I'll never stumble in my spiritual growth? That just simply means that, yeah, we might trip at times, we might stumble over a rock or a boulder, but we don't lose what we have in God in that moment. We don't lose our spiritual growth and go backwards and say, see, this life with Christ is, is so hard, I can't take it. No, we get up, all right, we put the band-aids on our boo-boos, all right? We brush ourselves off and we keep walking along the path, all right? That's where we are all in. We, not, we, might, not, we might stumble at times, but our spiritual growth is still there. We're not overcome. We're not, we're not abandoning our faith, and we hold tight through the storms. You see, we're not feasting at God's grand table to be all fat and sassy, All right, we're feasting so that we can grow in wisdom and knowledge of God in order to take it and share it with others, to share the bounty of God. But it's our choice again to come to the table and eat. God invites us to come. We have to accept the invitation. We have to RSVP. We surrender ourselves to God. We lay ourselves down. We surrender all our independence. We exchange it all for who we think we are for dependency upon all God provides. See, true surrender looks like this in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own ways. That means we set aside our selfish interest. We take up our cross daily. That means we're expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. Let me say that again. We're taking up our cross daily. What that looks like is no matter what comes today, Lord, 
I'm picking up my cross, and I am following you. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. This is a surrender of our life to gain eternity, a surrender of our selfish interests, our independence to follow Christ as his disciples, an exchange of all of ourselves to receive all of who God has created us to be, to receive life, abundant life. Now, I'm spending a little bit more time right now on this first exchange because I, I want us to get there if we're not there today. And if we've experienced that, there's going to be ups and downs. But this is the ultimate exchange. We keep, we keep ourselves at the table. We keep feasting upon God. It's important. We exchange our independence our, for dependency upon him. And guess what? We receive the bounty of his presence in our lives. He doesn't ask us to walk this path alone. He has sent his Holy Spirit to be our helper to be our guide, to show us the way to go. We don't have to do this alone. We exchange our sin, our guilt, our shame for forgiveness, grace, and freedom, and we receive a bounty of his peace, contentment, real joy, love, and mercy. And when I think about this for a minute, because that sounds good, but sometimes I'm just not happy. Sometimes I just ain't feeling the joy. And sometimes I'm just not full of peace. And maybe I'm a little disruptive today. What I'm talking about is at the core of our being. I liken it to like a river that flows through us. And in that river is real peace. In that river is real joy. In that river is real love. It's contentment. So no matter what hits me from the side of the bank, on the right or on my left, it doesn't matter because at the core of my being, I feel joy. I might find out tomorrow that something ails me. That's okay, because I know I'm in the palm of God's hand. That's contentment. That's peace. That's what I'm talking about. All right, I don't need to be devastated, although it would hurt a lot to hear that, something ailing me, okay, that needed work, all right, or whatnot. I'm physically, I mean. That's okay, because God gives us a peace. No matter what happens at work, we have a river of joy. <laughs> so that no matter what is being thrown our way, I can still be happy because it's not dependent on my surroundings and whether things go good today or don't go good today. I have a river of joy. That's the core. That's what we receive when we exchange ourselves and gives ourselves to God. We exchange our pointless thinking, our futile thinking, our short-sightedness to receive the bounty of wisdom and guidance from God. The word says, if you need wisdom, ask me. If you want to know the way to go, ask me. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge me, and I will make your path straight. That's who God is. He shows us his ways. He shows us his will. We're obedient to him. We exchange our own understanding, our desires, our efforts of being and doing. And our, you know what I'm talking about, those efforts. Like we're constantly working to please God. We don't have to work for that because we can receive the bounty of his care as we stay connected to that feast, as we stay connected to the vine, as we stay connected to that source. We receive his care. We receive his protection. We receive his protection provision. We receive his direction. When I read Psalms 91, friends, okay, I'm encouraged, and I pray that prayer that's in Psalm 91. Lord, I pray that you would command your angels concerning them. That's for my kids. I command your angels concerning them to guard them, Lord, in all their ways. And I've looked at it kind of like God's secret service agents, okay? that these little angels are going around. I'm praying that over my kids like daily. Command your angels concerning them, Lord, to guard them in all their ways. That's his protection. That's his provision. Let me tell you something. Without trying to get weepy today, when my son tells me, Mom, I know you're praying for me because I could have died tonight. Well, there's one of those things that 
<laughs> knock you a little bit, you know, out of the river and you have to get, dig deep again. You don't want to go down that rabbit hole of what ifs, all right? But he's, he, we know God's protecting. We know God's watching over us. It doesn't mean that we're superhuman, though, and we're not going to feel, okay? Or we're not going to have our moments, all right? We don't have to be perfect and all happy, happy all the time, and everything's unicorns and rainbows, all right? That's not what I, I believe God expects of us. We're human beings, for goodness sake. We're human beings. We're going to feel, all right? We're going to feel worry. We're going to feel grief at times. But that's where, instead of letting it take us down, we pray. Instead of letting us take it down, we worship. We exchange all of who we are and receive all God has in return. Now, let's take a quick look at this exchange, the dark exchange. And in Romans 1, it talks about this, verses 21 through 32. In the beginning of this chapter, Paul is talking about the Roman church, and it says that their faith is known all over the world. Paul talks about, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was so encouraged by what the Roman churches were, uh, how they were growing and how they were dis being discipled and how they were learning about Jesus Christ and spreading the good news. And then it goes on later in the chapter and it turns to the other side of those individuals who wouldn't receive the good news, who instead rejected the good news. They had all they could prepared before them a great feast, but said, no thanks, I'm not hungry. I don't want that to eat. This is the place, friend, of the unbeliever today. Romans 1.21 starts out and says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him or honor him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. It goes on in verses 22 through 23, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. See, they exchanged the glory of the ever-living God. They gave up his magnificence. They gave up his excellence. They turn their back on the fact that God is a reliable God, an honest God, a trustworthy God, an eternal God. They turn their back on it for idols. They gave up the fact that God is all-knowing, that he is present everywhere, that he is all-powerful. And there's big words to represent that. That's, the, that's just the truth. He is unlimited in his power. He's present everywhere. He is all-knowing. He's able to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. He's magnificent. They exchanged it all and said, no, thank you, and chose idols, lifeless items, or things that don't have any power or hope. There's no saving qualities in that keyboard. That keyboard can't do jack for me. All right, that microphone can't do anything for me, but that's the kind of things they were worshiping, things that had no life, no value. They're unable to set anybody free. I call this dumpster diving. They're, they went after the scraps, they went after the garbage, they went after the leftovers, they went after the sloppy seconds. And you know what it left them? Unsettled, hopeless, full of grief, full of despair, full of guilt, full of shame. They may have been temporarily satisfied, but at the end they were left empty and unfulfilled. It's kind of like going to the refrigerator and opening the door and hoping that something jumps out and bites you because it's gonna be that good to eat. And you open the door and there's nothing there. It's dumpster diving. I don't wanna say going to your refrigerator is dumpster diving unless you haven't cleaned it out for a while. <laughs> okay, side note, all right. It leaves us empty and unfulfilled. And guess, and this is what it says in scripture, God gave them over. He permitted them or allowed them to continue in their ways. Romans 1.24 says, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. God gave them over to the lusts of their own hearts their cravings, their longings, their desires for what was forbidden, impure motives. 
that goes on in Romans 1.25 to say they traded the truth about God for a lie. By their own choosing, mind you, their own choosing, they exchanged the truth of who God is for a lie. They exchanged that which might be known of God as true. They exchanged the fact of who God is and what is known about him, his goodness, his faithfulness, his care, his provision, his promises. They exchanged it all for lies, more dumpster diving. They're left with the lies of the enemy telling them they're smarter than God. We saw that in Genesis with Adam and Eve. They're left to make their own choices, believing that they can do whatever they want without consequences. Believing that God doesn't really care about man. Believing God is a disappointment and does not follow through. I've prayed all these prayers and God's never answered my prayer. God's just a disappointment. He's not really there. Believing the lie that they will never be worthy enough to be invited to God's table to feast. That was like my dad. He didn't believe he could be forgiven, even though I kept telling him that God loved him unconditionally. He didn't believe he could be forgiven. Mind you, before he died, he gave his heart to Christ. And I believe he's in heaven today. And I look forward to hanging out with him for eternity because we didn't have a great relationship here on earth. They didn't believe they were worthy enough to come to the table and feast. And Romans 1.26 says that's why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. He gave them over. He allowed them to be degrading and do vile passions, to dishonor themselves and disgrace themselves. And verse 28 says, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking. You see, they exchanged the life source, his abundant life, his mercy, his grace, a relationship with God, and he gave them over to a depraved mind. And that means that it was vain, an empty mind, uh, incapable of knowing the difference between good and evil. They became desensitized. They didn't want what God had. They were left to their own not being able to know right from wrong, loss of all conscious of things. And they pushed away the bounty of God in search of their own way. They chose the garbage heap over a great feast. They want their independence and their freedom, and they push away from the feast God has prepared through the sacrifice of his son Jesus. And it ends in, in Romans 1, talking about their, the fact that their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Folks, that's our world today. Haters, envious, murderers, quarreling, proud, insolent, invent new ways of sinning. Heartless, disobedient to parents, refuse to understand, they break their promises, they have no mercy. Folks, our world needs Jesus. So we can't write them off today. We can't write them off and just like, they're so wicked, they're so stupid. They're so dumb in what they're doing, and they don't understand it. We don't need to try to understand why they're doing what they're doing, because we know why they've chosen the dark exchange. But what we do know is that God wants to offer them the ultimate exchange. He wants them to come to him, so they no longer need to go into the world's garbage, and they no longer need to do dumpster diving. And don't give up today on those that you've been praying for for salvation. Don't give up. We need to believe today that God can renew the minds of those that have been depraved. We need to believe that God is a change agent. We sung that this morning. He's a change agent. Jesus changes everything. Do we believe that today? We believe that as we go and share the good news of Jesus Christ with everyone that we come in contact with. We share with them the feast of his bounty. Then there's the last one, the partial exchange. This is a little bit of toe-stepping, all right? And I have to say that God always steps on my toes first before he steps on yours. This partial exchange is an exchange only of some of our independence and we receive only some of God's bounty. This is an exchange where we won't give our all to God. We hold on to this world, and we're consumed and intrigued with its many distractions. I'm going to change it from we 
to they so we don't become too offended. They'll come to church when they feel like it and if there isn't anything better to do. They read the Bible out of obligation or if they don't feel like it, they don't do it at all. They serve so they don't feel guilty or they don't serve at all. They know who God is, but they don't know God as in having an ongoing inter, inter, intentional sorry, relationship with him where he is there all in the center of their lives. They know who God is, but they don't know God. See, so you know who Jody is, but I know Jody <laughs> because I've spent time with him. I've gotten to know him. I've asked him some tough questions. <laughs> He's had to answer them and vice versa. That's the way our relationship is with God. We might know he exists, but do we know God? Have we pushed into his word? Have we leaned into him? Have we received everything from that feast that he's prepared for us? They choose to accept the invitation of God. They choose to RSVP to the banquet. They come to Christ and ask him to be Lord of their lives. They choose to come, and, and at first they're just woofing everything down. They're just feasting like, oh, this is so good. This is awesome. This is the best meat I've ever had, the best fruit. They're even full and they're satisfied. But after a while, the food starts tasting a little bland. They start finding things wrong with it. They're not sure about this feasting thing anymore. Maybe they ate something and it made them feel sick or it didn't taste as good as they thought. Kind of like when we read God's word and he shows us something that we need to surrender to and we don't like that. And so we just shut the Bible and we move on to another book of the Bible because we don't need to deal with that. All right. They choose to start looking around to see if there's something better somewhere else. Their commitment is short lived. Their independence starts rising back up in them, called the flesh, <laughs> and their desires rise up within them. And God and his will and his ways and his plan is just not their priority. This reminds me of the parable in the book of Matthew ver uh, chapter 13 about the sower and the seeds. And the part that I want to read this morning is Jesus' explanation of this parable. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. I'm going to pause there and remind us today that last week when we did the production and when we uh, share the good news, anytime we're in the pulpit or we're online in prayer or anytime, all right, there's seeds that are planted. It's important for us to make sure that we are covering those seeds and we keep going after those seeds that were planted so the enemy doesn't have a chance to come along and snatch it up and take it out of their hearts. That's follow-up, friends. That's follow-up. That's discipleship. In verse 20, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. And then in verse 23, it talks about the seed that falls on good soil and that it takes root <clears throat> and produces a harvest. See, those who have made only a partial exchange have shallow roots. They haven't allowed their roots to go deep. They haven't dug in. And so they don't last long under stress and life's confrontations. Maybe they need someone to come alongside them and teach them and guide them through that. Perhaps they need to submit themselves to the great feast. Those who only have a partial exchange let the worries and cares of this life overtake them so easily. They long to be satisfied and they use things to do that, like addictions and hobbies, and financial gain, material possessions, even relationships with others. Sometimes we can go after a man or a woman, you know, in relationship because we're trying to fill this huge honking hole that we got in our hearts. When Jesus says, come to me, let me fill that hole. 
They rush to others for answers before they run to the word of God and worship and prayer. They offer God a token appearance at the table, but they're easily distracted. Like when we sit at the table and we get our phone out and how annoying that can be when you're trying to have conversation. They don't like to be told what to do. They don't want to be told to forgive. They don't want to be told how to love and care and serve. And they surely don't want to be told that I need to seek God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Those who have a partial exchange know God is there, and they'll go see him and talk to him, but on their own terms, when they want, or maybe when all the other avenues have failed. They pick and choose what they want, how they want it, and when they want it. They're not all in, and I call them picky eaters. You see, in the same way we choose to come to the table of God and feast on his bounty, we can also push ourselves away from the table. We can, we can stand up and, and observe other things that are going around instead of eating his feast. And if it doesn't suit us, we're going. We're out of here. How do we recognize someone? With, uh, how do we recognize a partial exchange? I don't want us to judge others. We need to judge ourselves first and take a look at ourselves first. How do we know and recognize a partial exchange? When the going gets tough, do we cower? Do we complain? Or do we take courage? When we face a crisis, do we panic? Well, initially we might, yes. But do we fall apart and become a mess and become unable to work and unable to function? Or do we pray? When we feel that a situation is hopeless, do we fall into despair or reach for God's hand? Are we dealing with the same things in our lives we've been dealing with for years? even after seeking godly counsel and his wisdom? Are we a victim in our life, or are we a victor through Jesus Christ? When we must make an important choice, whom do we seek for wisdom? Are we trying to please God, or are we trying to please man? When we're hungry, where do we go to get our satisfaction? Let's take a look at Revelations 3 as we get ready to close this morning. This is a letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea, Revelations 3, 14 through 22. I know all the things you do, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Ooh. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you'll be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness and an ointment for your eyes so you'll be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look. I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Talk about the confirmation of God's word. Hmm? Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches, to us today. God asks us today, friends, to be either hot or cold, but not lukewarm. To step to the table and eat his bounty instead of being double-minded and wishy-washy and unstable in all our ways. And the choice comes down to this. We have the, the opportunity to do the ultimate exchange. And that ultimate exchange requires surrender. Where we give everything to Christ and receive everything he's provided for us. We're living a full and abundant life with a core of peace, joy, grace, love, and freedom. We're surrendering our all to God and living dependent on him. There's the dark exchange where we're going to care for those who are in the dark. And let me say this out loud today. If you are in the dark today, and you're in that place where you have rejected the knowledge of God, you rejected the truth of God, you rejected the magnificent of God, let me say to you today that God invites you to his table to feast with him. He has everything that you need. 
He will bring you peace. He will bring you joy. He will bring enlightenment to your life. He will set you free. Come to the table and eat. Come to the table and eat. Believe through faith that God is who he says he is. He is good. Allow him to be the Lord of your life today. Church, I invite each one of us this morning to take a look inside. Have we only given a partial exchange to God, or are we all in? Are we hot, all in, or are we lukewarm and wishy-washy and double-minded and unstable? Remember, the satisfaction we received in feasting at the table of God and enjoying his bounty cannot be matched by anything in this world. Nothing that you try to use to satisfy and fill that hole in your heart will satisfy like Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing. Jesus Christ came that we might have life, abundant life. Let's take a look at these takeaways today, and all this will be online later this afternoon under our, after the sermon, our grill. Here's the takeaways for this morning. By God's divine power, he has given us everything we need for living a godly life. The life God provides is abundant life. It's rich, it's satisfying, it's more than adequate, it's abounding, it's full, it's real, it's genuine, it's active, it's vigorous. It overflows. Our world is in desperate need of Jesus. And as believers, as disciples of Jesus, we have a feast to share. As we are filled at the banquet table and we invite others to come to the table to feast with us. And we have a choice to make. We can receive all we can from God through complete surrender. Or we can choose to push ourselves away from the table in search of our own ways and be left wanting our God is glorious, magnificent, all-powerful, all-knowing, always present. He is truth and love. Our God is worth knowing and wants to be known by us in relationship. What choice will we make today? If you're sitting on the line, sitting on the fence, and you've been a little wishy-washy, jump in. Jump into the pool. Jump in the deep end. No floaties. Okay, let's just do this thing because we know that we will be saved. We know that we will be rescued. We know that God will give us everything that we need. Amen? Thank you for allowing me to share with you this morning, friends. I want to close in a word of prayer and just pray over you today as Sam gets ready to come. Father, I thank you for your word this morning that is active and alive. God, it separates the joints and marrow. It separates what's going on in our spirits today and reveals things in our hearts, Lord God, that we need to take care of. Lord, may we be honest before you this morning. Lord, are we all in? God, what areas in our life have we held back and not allowed you to take over? God, what, are, what dark holes in our hearts have we tried to fill with other things? Lord, today we choose to come to the banquet table all in, Lord God, and sit there and feast with you, God, and receive all that you have for us. And Lord, we pray for our unsaved today, Lord, those who don't know you, God, that haven't experienced this feast. Lord Jesus, may you, through the power of your spirit, speak to their hearts today. Convict us, Lord God, of any sin, God, and set us free as we come to you in surrender. We love you today, God. We love everyone that's here, those online this morning. I pray a blessing over everyone that hears this message, Lord Jesus, that they'll receive what the Spirit of the Lord has said. In Jesus' name, amen.